Hi. Um, I, I guess I should acknowledge that uh, our the original speaker scheduled for this week, uh, uh, unfortunately, is recovering from COVID. So we, we wish him a uh, very speedy recovery. Uh, but the silver lining is that um, Bob, uh, if it works, so that Bob can uh, tell us about this very interesting physics uh, this quarter. Um, so uh, we're excited to hear it. OK, thank you. So uh, I'm coming from just teaching my last class of the quarter. So is there a, ah, there's a physical pointer here, so I can use that. OK, so I wanted to tell you about, uh, well, what the title says. I mean, the, you've probably heard the term memory effect. You've definitely heard of infrared divergences. Uh, and I want to discuss the implications of that in scattering theory, you know, in ordinary quantum field theory, but uh, then in quantum gravity. And this is joint work with uh, Kardik Prabhu and Gautam Sevas Chandran, uh, the details of which uh, are in this paper that was posted on the archive a few months ago. And there are a lot of details in this that I won't uh, be delve into technical details that I on the asymptotic quantizations and so on that I won't be delving into. That's not really needed for the essential features that I want to talk about. Uh, you might have to click on the okay. So uh, to begin with, I should tell you what the gravitational memory effect is in physical terms. Uh, I, you know, you probably, and many of you have heard that, but we can imagine that we have this array of particles, uh, you know, as a gravitational wave detector. I mean, LIGO can only afford to put two of these uh, there or whatever, or effectively, well, really, okay, anyway. Uh, um, uh, but, you know, you do a little better with uh, an array like this. And if you imagine a gravitational wave coming in normally to the screen here, then the wave will sort of compress depending on its polarization. But if it's the axes or the way I'm doing it, compress in one direction, expand in the other over a half cycle, then over the next half cycle, compress in the opposite direction, expand in the other. So that's what happens when the gravitational wave is going by, but when the gravitational wave uh, is done going by, well, you have no more, you, you're back in flat space time, at least I'm only working to order one over R. Um, the particles one can show will return to relative rest with respect to each other, but they may not go back, they in, generically won't go back to their original uh, position. So the, the, this permanent relative displacement occurring at order one over R for gravitational radiation is what's referred to as the memory effect. But this isn't anything special to gravitational radiation or anything like that. This occurs, well, for all massless fields, it occurs in all, well, even dimensions, but four is very special in, and everything I'm going to be saying is that going to end up being special to four dimensions. So first of all, let, uh, you know, I'm talking about to order one over R and things like that in what I've been describing, but let me be a little bit more careful about where I'm going when I'm taking these limits. So in flat space time, I mean, in an asymptotically flat space time, we can do analogs of this, of course. If I introduce the retarded time coordinate, and I'm going to let xa in everywhere denote angular coordinates, what we're interested in is limits as r goes to infinity, but at fixed retarded time. Well, for ingoing states, I'd be interested in fixed advance time. So this is future null infinity that I'm talking about, and I will be talking in you know, about behavior and future null infinity. And 
in for any d, well, maybe it has to be bigger than two or so, but anyway, for any uh, d, radiation uh, will fall off in, in an, well, in flat space time, let's say, something that satisfies a wave equation in flat space time, radiation will fall off at the rate indicated here, one over r to the d over two minus one. Coulomb fields, again, in any dimension will fall off like one over r to the d minus three. Now, it's a completely generic feature of massless fields in even dimensions that there's a memory effect, well, analogous to what I just showed you, but it's even simpler to state, namely at Coulombic order, the field at late retarded times will not return to the, in general, generically will not return to the value it had at early retarded times. So I'll, I'll explain what this has to do with the memory effect as I described it. I mean, that'll be easy to, to see uh, in a minute. Interest, I mean, for space-time dimensions is quite interesting in that uh, both of these are order one over r. Coulombic and radiation things fall off at the same order. And this memory effect is then inextricably intertwined, as I've written here, with radiation. You can't, well, as I'll explain quite shortly, this is the origin of all infrared divergences in quantum field theory. I mean, I'm talking about classical solutions here, but that's going to give us the infrared divergences in quantum field theory. So going back to the gravitational case, and then I'll do the analogous electromagnetic case, you know, let me let H denote the deviation of the metric from a flat metric at order one over R. And what I'm saying is that this metric, it's actually just the angular components that would be relevant here in uh, four dimensions, at asymptotically late retarded times, don't go back to the values they had at asymptotically early retarded times. So this is future time-like infinity, this is spatial infinity, but this corresponds to taking the limit as you go to asymptotically early retarded times. This refers to the limit as you go to asymptotically late uh, retarded times. So what I showed you in the first, well, space, the radiation is assumed to go to zero at early and late retarded times. So you've got just ordinary, this is some ordinary flat type you know, metric, but the metric is different uh, here at the late times than it was at the early times, so that if I draw it in a, you know, sort of a fixed geometry or something, you know, if I make a gauge transformation to, to uh, set the metric to zero, then I'll have to push these points away from the circle, but it, it's really just the metric has not returned to its initial value. Uh, it's useful to write this as the integral of the Bondi news, which is a gauge invariant object. So this is an angle dependent quantity here, this memory tensor. I'm just integrating over each, uh, you know, ray of the, the uh, you know, of null infinity. Now exactly the same thing happens in electromagnetism. Uh, now I'll let A be the A mu be the vector potential at order one over R, and E are, is the angular components. E with an A is the angular components of the electric field at one over R. And the memory vector then would just be defined as the integral of E, so this is manifestly gauge invariant, because E is gauge invariant, 
Uh, and that's just the difference of the vector potentials that asymptotically late in early times. Again, the electric field is assumed to go to zero at asymptotically early and late times, and you get this uh, uh, difference. So, are we doing free field theory here? I mean, I mean there could it be. It doesn't matter because we're doing this all at infinity. What if there are massless charged particles? Oh, well, yeah, that's fine. We will be doing massless charged particles. But that, that doesn't affect any of this. So, yeah. Uh, okay. When, so, there is, you know, just as I gave this physical interpretation or viewpoint on the memory effect in the gravitational case, I don't have to draw as fancy a diagram in the electromagnetic case, because if the integral of E is non-zero, then that just means if I have a test particle initially at rest receiving this radiation, it would end up with a momentum kick. So at late times, late retarded times, it would go inertially moving off instead of returning to rest. So that's what the physical statement of the electromagnetic memory effect is. And, you know, memory is a simple physical uh, thing. So what does this have to do with infrared divergences and all that sort of thing when we get to quantum field theory? Well, I borrowed this slide from Gautam, so I didn't change these to capital indices or change this to a XA, which is what I'm using for the angular coordinates. But say in the gravitational case, we have some you know, gravitational wave from coalescence of binaries or whatever. You know, it'll look perhaps something like this, but the memory effect uh, will correspond to this H, not if it started out as zero, not returning to zero uh, at the end of this. But the point is, if you have a function that, let's say, starts out at zero, but then doesn't end up at zero, and you take its Fourier transform, you're going to get a one over omega divergence in the Fourier transform of that function. I mean, that's a straightforward fact. But that's exactly what's going on with infrared divergences. So when we do an asymptotic quantization, well, the quantum states are going to be determined by the radiation field. Now, I'm in, for the purposes of the talk, I'm just going to use the angular components of the metric perturbation. That actually isn't well defined. You know, it's it's U derivative. The news is well defined. One really should be working with that. I mean, that's similar to the scalar field is not actually. If we were doing a scalar field, a, a massless scalar field, that would its restriction to scry is actually not well defined as a quantum observable, but its U derivative is. But anyway, I think it's a lot simpler if we think of things in terms of just H. Everything can be done properly using, you know, news uh, instead of H in the quantization. But if we are trying to construct the usual Fox space of out states, uh, well, that's based on a one particle Hilbert space. That's based on taking positive frequency, well, data at scry, looking at positive frequency H's, and, uh, you know, taking this Klein-Gordon sort of inner product. I mean, there's an omega in here corresponding to the time derivative, but we take the Fourier transform and we only are considering uh, positive frequencies. But if I ask for what the one particle state or coherent state is, if I want to do that, of a classical solution with memory, the Fourier transform, uh, as we've just seen, will if it has memory, is going to diverge as one over omega, and this norm is going to be logarithmically divergent. So, 
if you try to stick some state representing that has memory in the usual fox face construction uh you're going to have a problem because it's going to have infinite norm or if it's a coherent state it's going to have an infinite number of particles in it now there's absolutely nothing wrong with states with memory and they're going to occur unavoidably they occur in classical scattering they're not you're not going to get rid of them in quantum scattering they're there but if you pretend that they're supposed to be stuffed in to this Hilbert space where they don't belong you're going to end up with divergences in your formulas in your expression for the for the uh, state so how does one normally deal with these uh, infrared divergences since they you know appeared in the earliest days of quantum field theory so this is not something uh, new that uh, you've got them and you're going to have to deal with them if you want to do uh, physics well normally you deal with it by pretending that your states are in the standard fox space and you can make that a division into hard and soft parts of your state, you know, at some frequency and make the assertion that I'm not the least bit interested in the soft parts. And people even say you can't measure them, which is ridiculous because this memory effect is easily measurable. But anyway, you can say I'm not interested in them. So then you can put in an infrared cutoff then, then your state will fit nicely in the uh, fox space that you're trying to stick it into, then you can calculate things like cross sections that include not just your hard particles that you are interested in, but arbitrary numbers of soft particles. Uh, you know, and then after you've computed these cross sections with the cutoff, you can remove the cutoff and get a well-defined answer, and that's perfectly satisfactory and I in fact if you want to get cross sections uh, anything that you hear further in this talk is not going to give you a better way of doing it I don't or I'll be very surprised very pleasantly surprised but yeah. nevertheless extremely surprised if, that, if it's uh, actually helpful but this is really pretty terrible from a fundamental viewpoint because well for two reasons I mean one is that there are really you know, legitimate degrees of freedom in memory. It's a legitimate observable. It can and in fact does get entangled with hard degrees of freedom that you know, even if you're only interested in these hard degrees of freedom, there are coherence issues uh, arising from the presence of memory that should be properly dealt with, which you can't deal with if you throw away memory by putting in a cutoff, you know, at the first step of your calculation. But I think even more so, I mean, what is it? You, so whether you whether, it, whether yeah. it's factorization works or not, uh, and whether infrared divergence cancel, it's a two different question. Uh, you you, you, you well, seems to imply that the for infrared divergence to cancel, the, the calculation has to be factorizable. Yeah, so if you have a state, if you have a state with memory, that will, when you try to stick it into the Fox space, will correspond to a coherent state. And that will have this factorization prop property, so you won't. So if what you're dealing with is a quantum version of a state with memory, you will be able to, you know, you will have these soft theorem factorization type properties that will allow you to do this. I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm, just I'm not saying, trying to do a good job in explaining I, 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 this I, I, and, I, and, and you'd be the one. I, I'm, I'm trying to understand. I think yeah. whether infrared divergence cancel in principle uh, and whether there is a factorization probability, I thought these are two different questions. Whether um, a particular cross process is factorizable, a particular observable is factorizable, 
is different from whether you know infrared divergence actually cancel. Right? Every observation yeah. has a resolution. Right? Once you do that, every observable is inclusive. Um, okay, I'm not sure I understood the last sentence. I guess what I'm claiming here is if your out state, well, specifically, if your out state were to correspond to a state with memory, and you try to stick it in to the usual Fox space where all the states don't have memory, then of course you would get a divergence in the, the expression for the state. But if you were to do this kind of procedure for such a state, it would give you, I mean, basically because you would have the factorization, it would give you a well-defined answer. Now, I'm not, claiming that that would work, you know, you want to consider some general scattering process. I mean, we'd have to know what state you really end up with. It won't be just some simple state with some definite memory or something like that. So I'm not, I don't want to make any claims that this always works or something, but this clearly does work well enough that people use it. I mean, that is presumably how people actually do cross-section type calculations. Again, please you correct me. You said this is a terrible procedure. I'm trying to understand. No, no, it's in not what sense, It's not a terrible in, procedure. In, in what sense fine, this is a terrible? If, but if you want to talk about coherence issues, you want to consider superpositions of states of different momenta, you can't really ask the question doing it that way. You know, I'm do you get trouble. interference when you send in a one particle state that's a superposition, that's a wave packet superposition of states of different momenta. Uh, you can't really ask that, you know, you really have to be working with momentum eigenstates typically in doing this. Anyway, I, I'm not, I mean, uh, let's say, I'm not making any strong, I'm not intending to make any serious claims here. Uh, uh, you know, beyond the fact that there are procedures for pretending that you're working in the usual Fox space and dealing with the states that you actually have, which are not in the usual Fox space, which give infrared divergences. And I'm, you know, this was an attempt at explaining how you do that, but it's by no means a proof that it would always work or anything like that. I mean, I'm not. But anyway, I'm not uh, making any strong claim. This is just uh, you know, intended as, well, what do people do? But I'm saying this is not very satisfactory from a more fundamental point of view as opposed to a practical, you know, if you want to get a cross section for an accelerator, this is fine. And again, as I've already said, I, I'm not going to tell you Certainly in this talk, I'm not going to tell you something better to do. Um, but there are issues that this is not allowing you to even think about. Uh, but more fundamentally, you don't, you don't have a legitimate Hilbert space of in and out states, and you don't have a legitimate actual S matrix between them. You have a prescription, you know, for doing things that are sort of formally like you had an S matrix, but putting in cutoffs and then, you know, getting cancellations and taking limits, but you don't actually have, you can't actually tell me what the in state is and what the out state is and what the finite amplitude, not probabilities you can tell me, but the amplitude of going from whatever in-state you specify to whatever out-state. I mean, the exact state, not just some infrared cutoff version of the state. So anyway, I, I'm saying one might want to do better than that, not from a practical matter, but from a fundamental matter point of view. And there is something uh, better that's been done that, uh, I mean, much better from the fundamental point of view. 
that's been around for 50 years. Yeah, and well, I'm sure everyone has heard of this and uh, 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 and so on, although, you know, the, what the exact construction is, uh, well, is something that I'm going, going to explain. But if you want to have a true in and out Hilbert spaces and then actually have an S matrix between them, you're going to have to incorporate states with memory because you're going to get them in scattering and, you know, you can't do this without uh, incorporating them. And again, over 50 years ago, Fideev and Kulish gave uh, such a prescription, which is usually described as dressing the charged particles with a cloud of soft photons. What the cloud of soft photons really is, is an incoming electromagnetic radiation state that has memory. And if the memory is suitably paired with the state of the charged particles, you can make this work. So that's what I, well, what I'm going to be doing in the remainder of the talk is explaining what this Fedev and Kulish construction is, but in this language of memory, and as I'll explain, associated charges. Then I'll show that this construction fails. It works nicely in QED with massive charged particles. It fails in QED with massless charged particles, but it fails much more catastrophically in quantum gravity. So after this I show the you same it fails, then I'm going to, of course, have to say a few words about maybe what one should do. But this is the same as saying you should scatter jets, yeah? I mean, I think that's uh, how physically a collider person would describe this. Right? The, at long distances, you're talking about uh, the Fidei of Coolish. At long distances, you have kind of a heavy electron, maybe you approximate it as a Wilson line, it has some collimated field that comes off of it with some finite width. That's a jet, and you have to dress it with the with the uh, Coulomb field that comes from the source Wilson line. It's not. No, I think the the jets I think have to do with the massive massless case. There isn't any such thing. Again, uh, there may be language uh, uh, barriers and issues in uh, understanding what you're saying, but uh, uh, no, I don't think there's anything having to do with jet. There is very much something having to do or related to jets in the massless case, but. Uh, These cloud of soft photons are, are not virtual. They're, they're you know, yeah, no, they're not virtual. No, they're I, I'm not talking about a virtual cloud. Oh, so it's not Coulomb cloud. Like well, I'm just saying that a, that a charged particle sources an electromagnetic field even at long distances. That's, yeah, but that uh, the Coulomb field in some sense is not an independent dynamical degree of freedom. You've got to put in this cloud of soft photons, which is genuine dynamical degrees of freedom. That is truly radiation, but it's radiation with memory, and you know you can get. You know, since the memory just depends on, you know, this integral, you can make it arbitrarily low frequency. So you can put in these arbitrarily low frequency photons uh, in as long as they have the right memory. Well, I'll explain that later. Let me get to one important major further tool that you know, will help explain and analyze something, which is that, well, there is a close relation between, you know, memory and, well, asymptotic symmetries, which, since the asymptotic symmetries will give rise to charges and so on, that you know, one will be able to get formulas for memory in terms of charges uh, and so on that will be extremely useful for uh, the further analysis. So, uh, of course, we have gauge transformations in electromagnetism, but if I take the gauge function to be a function of angle only, 
This will fall off like one over R and will satisfy the asymptotic conditions that I want. So this will be, uh, you know, a, I won't destroy asymptotic conditions with this gauge transformation, but that gauge transformation actually is a symmetry rather than a gauge transformation in the precise sense that if you look at the symplectic form, the variations of the field by this gauge transformation are not degeneracies of the symplectic form. So again, that that's well, in the gravitational case, that will single out the, you know, well, in that case, the BMS transformations from the, you know, arbitrary local gauge transformations. You, you know, you throw away, you don't count gauge degrees of freedom in your phase space, you factor them out, but you do count symmetries. Well, we don't, I, I don't need to do any ideological uh, type work on that. The only important thing about that is that it kind of accounts in a way for the existence of, well, charges and fluxes associated with these so-called large gauge transformations. And the charges, again, I'm at no infinity, so I, I can pick some cross-section at some arbitrary retarded time. The formula for the charge associated with this large gauge transformation, well, this is the one over R squared part of the field. This is, would be, if lambda was one, the ordinary formula for the electric charge, but now it's got this uh, lambda in front of it. Um, now, the existence of memory, I mean, at, at Again, the electric field, the electric field is zero at these late and early times. So these A's are pure gauge at early and late times, but their difference, which is gauge invariant, their difference corresponds to a large gauge transformation. So You know, so there's a direct connection in that way between, you know, these large gauge transformations and memory. And with that, it's not too shocking that there is a formula that one can derive for, uh, well, the charges, the charge difference between asymptotically late times and asymptotically early times that's related to the electromagnetic memory. And if there was some massless charged particles, you'd get a contribution from the charge current flux to null infinity. So where this formula really comes from, or probably a better way of understanding it, if we put the Q at I naught on the left and put everything else on the right, the Q and I naught is actually the charge that generates large gauge transformations on all of the fields. Uh, and, well, this is what generates large gauge transformations on the massive charged fields at late, you know, at asymptotic infinity. This is what generates the large gauge transformations on any massless charged fields. And this is what generates, the memory is what generates the large gauge transformations on the electromagnetic field. So it's really saying the total generator of large gauge transformations can be broken up into these separate parts. But you know, this is a difference of charge is flux of charge and this memory contribution. Right, and this uh, charge at asymptotic relay times is just determined by the, you know, the Coulomb fields of the outgoing uh, charged particles. Okay, It'll, so you'll see why it's useful to have these formulas 
shortly, but let me uh, continue on to the gravitational case. So the analog of those large gauge transformations, namely the diffios that preserve the asymptotic conditions and are not degeneracies of the symplectic form, those are the BMS transformations. And the ones of interest uh, here and now are the super translations, which are angle dependent translations basically at Scribe. Mm -hmm. They're the analog of these, the large gauge transformations in electromagnetism that I just uh, was describing to you. And these also have associated charges. This is the one over R cube part of this component of the vial tensor that in Schwarzschild, you know, you'd have a vial tensor that goes like M over R cubed. So this would just, uh, well, give you the mass in Schwarzschild and if F were one, so this was a time translation that this would just give you the mass. You get some extra correction when you have radiation. And of course, well, this is quite general, but it's an analog of the formula that I had in electromagnetism where we had the one over R squared part of the electromagnetic field and we didn't have any extra uh, term like that here. But we have exactly an analog formula for Again, it's really the charge at spatial infinity is the sum of these other quantities that are that are uh, you know generating the the uh, these super translations on separate pieces. Okay, and now there's a very, for the Fidei of Coolidge construction, there's an extremely important, well, you might call it conservation law on this charge at spatial infinity. So I've been talking about future null infinity, but of course I can say the same things, all the same things with possible the future sign changes and past null infinity. And I can look at the charge at spatial infinity that I get by taking the limit of early retarded times on future null infinity. That's how I get to spatial infinity that way. And I can also go to spatial infinity from past null infinity by taking a limit to late advanced times. It also gets me towards spatial infinity. And the statement is that uh, these charges match up under antipodal identification of the two spheres that we're defining these charges on. So uh, again, that is true under you know some reasonable regularity conditions in the Maxwell case that's true under the kind of asymptotic conditions that As Ashtakar and Hansen uh, wrote down you know over 40 years ago uh, in the in the uh, gravitational case I mean it'd be nice to actually prove that these conditions are satisfied with reasonable initial data but I don't have any particular concerns about that. You actually need a slight strengthening of the conditions, but you get this uh, antipodal matching of charges. Okay, so now uh, I need, I'll put everything together with Fidev Kulish in just a minute, but I need to say a few things about Hilbert spaces of states with memory because if you construct the usual Fox space in the usual manner for out states, let's say, uh, all of those states have vanishing memory. But it's easy to construct representations that have non-vanishing memory. The easiest way of doing that is to take the usual, you know, Fock Hilbert space, 
which has you know the field operator defined on that in the usual way in terms of annihilation and creation operators and now just shift it by a multiple of the identity where this h capital h is some classical field i mean it's multiplying the identity operator but a classical field with memory so now, uh, I mean, your states have been identified, you know, vacuum, one particle, et cetera, but now they have a completely different interpretation in terms of what the fields are doing. All of these states now have a memory given by the classical memory of H. So you can do that, you know, for any choice of memory. Memory is some tensor on a two-sphere, so there's lots of possible memories. If you, if you use H's with two H's with the same memory, then that's those, you're going to get unitarily equivalent representations of the fields. Uh, uh, um, but if you use an H with memory and an H, uh, and no H at all, or you use two H's with different memories, you get unitarily inequivalent representations. So this gives, you know, a construction of zillions of states that have all the possible, all, all states all realized as vectors in some Hilbert space with field operator acting on them, uh, you know, that, give you all possible memories. So one idea you, one might pursue to you know, get a legitimate in and out Hilbert spaces, get a legal S matrix with no, because now you know, you're accommodating all these states with memory. Well, you could try taking a direct sum over all possible memories of these constructions but that's a colossally big Hilbert space, and it actually won't even work in terms of you take the in Hilbert space to be that it won't evolve to things in a similarly constructed out Hilbert space. You might try taking direct integrals. That's a lot more promising looking over memories. That doesn't I mean, that's something Gotim and I spent a lot of time looking at over the last you know, couple of years, because that at one point seemed like a promising way to, to proceed, but we're convinced that that doesn't work either, but I'm not, uh, you know, let me not attempt to try to go into the details of that. But Fideyev and Kulish came up with a really nice idea that does work in massive, quantum electrodynamics. And that's to use this idea that the large gauge charges at spatial infinity are conserved. Of course, they didn't formulate it in this way and so on, but they're, you know, this is an equivalent formulation of their uh, construct construction. So we can work in some sector of definite charges at spatial infinity, and that'll get preserved under scattering, except these charges are not invariant under rotations or Lorentz boosts in general. So, you know, if we want to have the Poincaré group act on our in and out states, which I think most people would, uh, you know, that's not a good idea. But that does work if we go to vanishing charges because vanishing if all charges all of the large gauge charges vanish that is invariant under Poincaré transformations and that uh, can give us uh, then a Hilbert space to work with now uh, that's a little awkward in that we also need vanishing total electric charge, and maybe you wanted to do scattering of two electrons that has charge two. Uh, so to make this work, you'd have to, you know, add two positrons that as incoming states that you 
well, the usual terminology is put behind the moon or whatever, they, they don't interact you know, with the electrons you're interested in and so on. I mean, I, I, I think the original Fideyev and Kulish paper may be a little ambiguous about this, but you know, papers by Froelich, uh, uh, you know, pointed this out very uh, clearly not long thereafter. Okay, so how do we make, we've got to make, so we can make total electric charge zero, putting some extra charges behind the moon if we want. How do we make all these other large gauge charges zero? Well, that, there's a really clever idea because the momentum eigenstates are, they're improper states, of course, but they're formally eigenstates of the charge, well, for incoming things for the charge at past time-like infinity. So if you take an arbitrary incoming momentum state, momentum eigenstate, the idea is you can make zero memory at, you want to get, sorry, make zero charge at spatial infinity. You know, we're using this formula, we don't have any J out, we don't have any massless particles. Uh, so we want to make this zero if we make this equal to that, it's a sign change going to pass null infinity, uh, then we'll make zero charge at spatial infinity. So you insist that if I'm going to have this incoming momentum state, the incoming photon states are required to have a memory given by this formula. And if you do that, that makes the charge at spatial infinity of this improper state together with the proper state with memory of the electromagnetic field, that makes it have zero charge at spatial infinity. Now we can take a direct integral over the p's to get a nice separable, et cetera, in Hilbert space, all of the states are eigenstates of charge with uh, zero charge, eigenstates of charge at spatial infinity with zero charge. They're going to evolve to eigenstates of zero charge by this conservation law, so they're going to evolve to states in the similarly constructed out Hilbert space. And now we have a completely well-defined scattering, except we're not allowed to send in, you know, a bare uh, electron state, we have to pair that with photons. I mean, these can be arbitrarily soft photons, but we have to pair that with a photon state that has this memory. So that's, uh, I never understood what people were talking about with dressing electrons, but this is, I claim, what people are talking about, or what Fideyev and Kulish certainly we're talking about in terms of dressing electrons. Okay, but now that works. I mean, it's got some strange features. I mean, why are you, why do you have to send in exactly the right amount of memory and the electromagnetic radiation in order to pair that with the photons. It's not like the photons have this dressing attached with them. You're really sending in electromagnetic radiation that is pairing with the photon. Um, but you run into trouble with this. Cons so you, it's not an ideal solution to the problem anyway, but you could live with it and work with it, and now you really have Hilbert spaces and S matrices and, and all that. But if you try to do this in the massless case, well, everything is kind of the same. Uh, uh, you know, again, it's the momentum eigenstates of the massless charge particles, the improper momentum eigenstates that are uh, eigenstates of the uh, 
well, now it's the you know integrated flux of charge. It's the J that uh, counts in terms of its contribution to the charge at spatial infinity. So you could again try to pair that with electromagnet with a photon state with the right memory to cancel out the charge at spatial infinity. But now there's a problem, and this does have to do with the jets and so on. I mean, or at least it's related to that because uh, the J in this case, in the no, in the zero mass case, has angular delta function singularities. And when you integrate to get what memory you have to pair with, you get a memory that's going to diverge like one over distance from where the singularity is. But that's going to make the memory not square integrable, integrable over the sphere. And that's going to make the energy that you'll have to put in the soft photons infinite. I mean, they're arbitrarily low frequency, but they're singular enough in the, you know, the, the extra angular singularity, uh, uh, you know, makes them unsuitable for pairing, you know, well, you can formally still do it, but the states that you're getting in the Fide of Coolish Hilbert space, I would claim, are unphysical. But things are actually, if you're trying to do this sort of thing, a lot worse in gravity, but for different reasons. In fact, the angular singularities are not as bad because the, again, the J would have a delta function in angle type singularity, but you're basically satisfying solving a double divergence, you know, that makes the singularity only logarithmic in distance, it's square integrable, it'll have finite energy, uh, and so on. But the whole dressing idea just doesn't work at all, because uh, the, the problem is that if you dress, I mean, no matter how soft you make them, the dressing that you use your incoming gravitons are going to add some more to the maybe only a tiny bit more but it messes up the eigenstate property it's not it's going to to contribute to the charge at spatial infinity the soft graviton flux is going to contribute something to the charge at spatial infinity it can contribute an arbitrarily small amount but it messes up the eigenstate property and your in states no you no longer have any argument for the in states evolving to the out states so we can show this much more generally uh, that there are no states that are eigenstates not even even if you don't require eigenvalue zero like Fedeyev and Kulish did there are just no eigenstates at all of the super translation charges except of course for the vacuum state but that's not enough states to do much in the way of scattering theory okay so in so well in the last uh, few minutes i want to say a few words about at least my views about what one should do about that again from a fundamental level not from a practical standpoint and how you'd calculate cross sections or do the various calculations that everyone is already doing. So in a situation like this where you have a lot of states that of interest, they're going to arise in scattering that don't live in the, you know, in your favorite Hilbert space that you would have liked to put them in. I mean, that's a situation that one gets used to very quickly in quantum field theory and curved space time, where you have, you don't have any preferred vacuum state, you don't have a preferred notion of particles, 
and they're just all in an open universe at least there are just zillions of possible states that you might consider and they don't live in the same you know you know in in any they don't jointly live in any irreducible hilbert space representation it is much more sensible in that sort of context i would argue to uh well go to what i think one would call the algebraic viewpoint on states so the idea is that you you know have your complete list of local sort of field observables well they could include memory and things like that that are not local but you have your complete list of observables and you define a state to be a complete list of all correlation functions of those observables now you can't write down any list of correlation functions because they have to, they're required in the definition one requires that they be positive if you have an observable of the form a star a you want the the uh, expected value of that given by the state uh, uh, to be positive uh, and you need compatibility with field equations commutation relations and so on but the idea is you write down uh, you know your complete list of observables and you define a state to be a mapping from the observables to the complex numbers that satisfies this positivity condition. The point is there's no need to even mention the, the idea of Hilbert spaces to define a state. Of course, if we have a Hilbert space and we have the observables represented as operators, the take expectation value uh, you know, gives you uh, a state and maybe much less obviously, um, if you have a state in this sense, you can construct a Hilbert space in which that state lives as a vector, you know, that carries a representation of the observables. I mean, this isn't as mysterious as it sounds you basically use your algebra of observables as the Hilbert space you use your state as the inner product and you quite simply get what you want so the situation i would say on you know so now i'm giving you my you know views on this i mean uh one shouldn't be looking for just a Hilbert space and all states of interest live in that Hilbert space. You know, the best analogy I can come up with is if you're, you're on a manifold of some topology, you're not gonna insist that you have one coordinate system that covers that whole manifold. And if you're living on a paracompact manifold, non paracompact manifold, which is probably a better analogy, you know, you're going to need some infinite collection of coordinate systems or whatever to describe everything that you might be interested in in your in your manifold. So for these hypothetical states that don't live in the same separable patch yeah. of Hilbert space, are you allowed to take superpositions of them? Yeah, but there won't be any interference between them. You know, they effectively have so in fact, they have zero inner product. How is it different than like super selection sectors? Uh, it's not very, I mean, you would, I super guess. Super selection uh, sectors are very common. I mean. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we should just call this super selection sector. Um, right, but the, but the useful super selection sectors are given by eigenstates of these charges at spatial infinity, and there aren't any eigenstates. So we don't have these well-defined, I mean, in the quantum gravity case, we don't have well-defined super selection sectors. Two states that have non, you know, one state may have charges in some range, another state may have charges in another range, th those are super selected, but it's not like we can just add up these super selection sectors in 
some way. I, I mean, at least I don't see any way of doing that. But we often have situations in quantum field theory where we have a theory that has a moduli space of vacua, and we have a Hilbert space sort of associated to each point in this manifold, but we yeah. don't usually contemplate a direct sum of those Hilbert spaces or a direct integral. Yeah, but now, right, and no reason to perhaps, but now if you're doing scattering theory and you're doing, you know, you want to get a Hilbert space, you know, you've got a, this collection of Hilbert spaces of different moduli, moduli for the in states, and a similarly, you've got all these Hilbert spaces for the out states, and you find that if you evolve from a state of definite modulus, you know, picked out from your Hilbert space of definite modulus at early times, that evolves to a whole range of moduli at late times, now what do you do? I mean, that won't happen with moduli, but that is what's happening with memory, and it, it is completely analogous. I mean, the memory and charges of spatial infinity is very, I think, very analogous to the moduli in your example, but you've got a situation where scattering evolves you, evolves you from a state of definite memory, so zero no memory to states with all sorts of memory. Anyway, to finish up, uh, so again, when I say do, I mean, you know, in principle, not actually try to do any calculation or do anything, you know, calculate anything that anybody would be the least bit interested in, but how should one uh, think about scattering theory? I mean, so you can allow yourself unlike Fideyev and Coolidge, to consider any end state that you want. You don't have to dress, even if you're doing massive QED, you don't have to dress the electrons or whatever, you know, no dress requirements or anything uh, like that. So you can have a whatever memory, whatever charges at spatial infinity you want to consider. And the state, which will be, again, specified by all of its, you know, smeared correlation functions, that will evolve, that in state will evolve to some out state. You know, there will be some well-defined scattering uh, map. Clearly that in principle can be computed by perturbative methods, but I don't know, I've only, I haven't thought that much, but I don't really know how to do it. I mean, the LSC, kind of approach is really based on your being able to get all the states you want by hitting the vacuum with field operators or whatever, and that's not, you can't get states with memory doing that. I mean, we want to get all the states. So I don't know how to do that, but I, uh, yeah, but now, yeah, we will certainly get rid of any infrared divergences. They're all artifacts of trying to put states into Hilbert spaces where they don't belong. And now we're just letting the states be whatever they want to be. So I think it would be interesting to develop such a scattering theory. And you know, I'm not likely to try to do it myself really in a serious way, but I think that would be interesting. So I've told you a lot of things. Let me uh, you know, conclude. So. I've told you what the memory effect is. That's just at a classical level, a completely generic and I could even say mundane feature of massless fields. I mean, that's how solutions to the wave equation, you know, especially with sources and especially with nonlinear interactions, the Coulombic part of the field at early times at null infinity at early retarded times is not going to go to the same value at late times. That's just what happens. And that's going to happen and that is and does is does happen in the quantum theory as well. Uh, uh, and you know if you try to use the standard Fox spaces, you are going to get infrared divergences, which 
people know how to deal with in terms of calculating the things they want to calculate. And I don't have any argument with that in terms of calculating what you want to, what they want to calculate or whatever. Uh, you can get uh, for massive QED, the fideyev Coolish construction gives a way of doing that, uh, of doing, you know, really getting Hilbert spaces and really getting uh, uh, a genuine S matrix. But that is really, uh, you know, uh, that is really very special to this context in the sense that it really fails when you have massless sources. So it fails in other contexts. It fails particularly badly in quantum gravity. I don't believe that there's any way of quote, solving this problem in the context of, in the sense of finding some single Hilbert space that isn't enormously, you know, isn't the Hilbert space of all Hilbert spaces or something, you know, that, that's usefully of a useful size that will encompass all the states that you're going to get in quantum gravity. And I would, you know, advocate taking this algebraic viewpoint then again at this sort of fundamental level on scattering. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I have a basic confusion about this. So at some point in life, we all learned that if someone comes and hands you a Hamiltonian, you can use that Hamiltonian to make a time evolution operator, which is unitary. <coughs> and then if you take the infinite time limit of this thing, you can construct, like at least perturbatively, you can construct an explicit unitary operator that corresponds to scattering. Well, OK. so. We have the Hamiltonian, but you, I think implicit in that you have the Hamiltonian operator on some fixed Hilbert space or something. That's right. So some slicing. Right. But that isn't the case in quant. You don't. It, it is still true that if I give you a state at some given time, we can evolve it to the future or the past. But we ha I mean, I, as I indicated, there are all these memory representations and all that. I mean, and if you, the memory is not conserved. So that's what And I'm so asking. if you evolve from you know, something with zero memory in the past, it won't, I mean, there's no reason why, why the state in some particular choice that you've made like zero memory in Hilbert space Evolve. It'll evolve to something. But if it's unitary evolution, how can yeah. it evolve to something that doesn't have memory? Because that's that that does have memory. Because, like you said, that's a that's non-unitary evolution. Whereas I no, but, I mean, it, well, the unitary we need the Hilbert space. So, really, at the beginning, you have to tell me what your Hilbert space is. But Zero if you tell memory. me you want your Hilbert space of states. To be the usual incoming Fox space states without any memory. That's right. Then, yeah, I mean, th there, there is some Hilbert space on which the evolution could be described as unitary, but it, the out states won't be anything like the standard Fox space. There'll be some weird looking set of states with all sorts of memory and all that sort of thing. Even though the, the operator I used to get from in to out was explicitly constructed to be unitary. Yeah, well, I don't, I mean, there's not any problem with conservation of probability or, or evolution of states. It's, but if you want to define the in and out Hilbert spaces in a symmetric manner, you want to use a construction for the in Hilbert space and then use the time reverse, so to speak, of that construction for the out Hilbert space, those don't evolve to each other. There are zillions of Hilbert spaces all over the place. And though that pair of them is the wrong choice, you know, if you want to do evolution, I mean, you know, in ordinary quantum mechanics, there's really just, you know, one 
there's a unique representation or whatever. So you don't come into this problem and you can just be talking about the one Hilbert space and you never consider states out, you know, you don't consider Schrodinger, you, you don't consider some other kind of wave function other than square integrable things and so on, you know, because there isn't, I mean, you, well, you can make some other representations. I mean, actually the loop quantum gravity people do analogs of some other weird representations, but uh, anyway, so there isn't an issue, you know, of you don't end up in the same out Hilbert space as you started with the in at asymptotically early times. Yeah. Uh, so when there's been people trying to use scattering amplitude ideas to find gravitational wave radiation and effective potentials and so on, and it seems like there is this is a case where like the memory is actually relevant. The sense that like the black holes will have a kick after they spiral into each other, but they don't worry about any of these things. You, like so, I guess it would seem like somehow their answers are still making sense. Uh, because they're dropping some sub leading things? Is that the. Uh, well, I don't, I mean, they're not trying to calculate in, in states and out states. And they're, they're basically, they're certainly ignoring infrared divergences. Now, if you asked, you know, how would they calculate memory, which I don't think they're calculating, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm aware of the work you're talking about. I don't, there's a lot about that work that I don't really understand what's going on. I mean, I, I think the work, you know, they're doing a lot of amazing things in the work. So I don't think it's nonsense or anything. I, when I say I don't understand, that isn't, that's a statement that I, I don't understand, not a statement that I don't believe it or whatever. But, uh, like but I think, I mean, you know, they have these formulas for amplitudes and they're using them in some way to make contact with post Newtonian type things and I don't really understand how they're making that contact. And if you ask the amplitudes people to answer some question about memory, I don't know if they'd be able to or they'd have some way of doing that. I mean, I just don't know. But this is something you should be able to measure with Lisa or something. Like the memory. Yeah, yeah, sure. So is it something that you can derive from the the effective potential or post-Newtonian expansion? Or well, in the post-Newtonian expansion, I mean you get there are two contributions going back to this formula. You can think of this. In the gravitational case. You can think of this as a formula for memory. There are there is a contribution from the charges, uh, in particular, well, at late times and early times. This contribution is referred to as ordinary memory, and that that's associated with you know these massive, the asymptotic behavior of the massive particles. Well, if you use a retarded solution. You don't have incoming radiation, then this would be given by the incoming massive uh, bodies that you're talking about in your post Newtonian expansion. So, this term would immediately show up at a reasonable low order in a post Newtonian expansion. And again, this is referred to as ordinary memory, and that appears in papers in the 1980s, early 1980s that are doing post Newtonian type stuff. This is what's referred to as the null memory or the nonlinear memory or the Christodoulou memory or something. This was only noticed in early 1990s or so. So this is the contribution from the gravitational radiation that, that makes it to null infinity. Now, in the post-Newtonian stuff, the well, okay, I'm a little confused as to, you know, it's two and a half post Newtonian order where you first get radiation, and this is radiation squared. So 
I'm not sure I'm doing the counting right, but this wouldn't appear to like fifth new post-Newtonian order, which is about where people are now in calculations or something. But I mean, I, you know, so I, I mean, certainly in the post-Newtonian literature, this wouldn't, this definitely would not appear until maybe very recently, and I'm not sure if anything has been done very recently. There are no further questions. Let's thank Bob again.